Okay, guys, I think um, we've got enough people here that I'm, I'm going to start my little chat today. So thank you for coming on um, Throwback Thursday to my presentation on my experience with the depression sickness. And I kind of want to take you a little bit on a journey with what I experienced. So I know that you guys have read or potentially have read the, uh, the, the sort of the blurb that was sent out about this brown bag. But I'm going to read it to you again, and then I'm going to move on and sort of take you through an experience that I had this past July, um, and, and then the follow-up that happened after that. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about what happened to me initially. I just kind of want to bring you guys along into what um, I experienced. I will say that what this is, is I was on a diving um, training down in Cave Country, which is northern Florida, um, this past end of June, beginning of July. And I have done um, thousands and thousands of dives. I have a lot of training in, in both recreational and technical diving. I have a lot of certifications in both levels. I'm an instructor. Um, I'm a very safe diver. I'm the diving safety officer for the aquarium. And so I live by the stuff that I try to get the divers here to live by. And yet, with all that said, I still got... Um, quite injured during this diving trip. So I kind of want to take you through what I experienced as well as um, talk a little bit about how this happened to me. So hang on one second. And by the way, over here, I'll talk about this later on. You know, the people who are tuned in on the stream can't see this, but it's my, the diving rig, the machine that I was using for diving. It's not open circuit, it's called closed circuit rebreather. Uh, as well as some other ancillary equipment. I'll talk about that throughout the course of this. Um, um, right now, I'm going to try to turn all these lights on. What's up with that? That's going to get those off. That's good. <laughs> I don't want Bill to fall asleep because I've had him do that to me before. <laughs> Um, hang on, I don't know what that's all about. Okay. <laughs> so this is going to be a brief description of actually the day when this incident happened to me. And so bear with me as I read you a bit of the experience from that day. I'd like you to picture yourself submerged in a cave the darkness is so complete, so inky black, that it's almost a tangible thing. <clears throat> You're back so far in the cave that you have to swim for an hour just to reach the first glimmer of natural light. You'd have to swim for an hour before you have any hope of reaching even a single breath of air. The sense of isolation and remoteness is crushing. Even the floor beneath you is death. If you so much as touch it, a wall of silt billows around you. A wall not even your primary dive light can penetrate. The hopelessly thin guideline, your only pointer to the way out, permanently lost to the silt. You touch the bottom and you will literally find yourself searching for that line for the rest of your life. Now picture yourself in this desolate environment so far from anything normal and safe and imagine how you'd feel <clears throat> if, as you try to take a breath from the machine on your back, tasked with keeping you alive, you find it's nothing but water. Fear engulfs you as you also realize you've just donated your backup breathing supply to your buddy. You can't breathe. You're suffocating. Your lungs are empty. Unreasoning panic wells within you as you frantically swim towards him, gesturing madly that you can't breathe, desperately tugging at the regulator that's in his mouth. You gasp in a breath, the life-giving gas flooding back into your lungs. Fearing an accidental descent to the salty bottom, you pin yourself to the ceiling and take stock of the situation. Reaching above your head, you retrieve the discarded breathing loop from your rebreather, the thing that moments earlier was filled with water, and place it in your mouth, anxiously taking a hesitant breath. Your confident, acoustic, corrosive fluid created by water entering your rebreather is about to flood into your lungs, <clears throat> searing your airway shut. But you have no choice. You need the machine to survive this hostile environment, there's a terrible gurgle, but you can breathe for now. You still have to manage to make it out of the cave 
an hour swim with a rebreather that's rattling and gurgling with every breath. A rebreather you're confident will kill you at any moment. Oh, and by the way, your instructor is making you exit with the lights out, following the line by feel, your fingers circling in the pitch black with no mask on. What if I was to tell you that 40 minutes after exiting the water, after surviving an incredibly stressful dive, that after all that, what if I told you that your nightmare hadn't even begun? Would you want to hear more? This is my story of surviving the bins. That was more kind of an attention getter, but it actually is a very important component to what happened to me on July 4th. So as I said, the first week of July, I was down in North Central Florida, AKA Cave Country, doing a combined training of Mod 2 and CCR Full Cave. What this is, is uh, for you divers, it's a trimix level certification for rebreathers, as well as a rebreather Full Cave certification. Um, I have a lot of training in open circuit, and now I have a lot of training in closed circuit, but I've never done my Mod 2 level, and I've never done caves in a rebreather. I was with a couple of people who are incredibly experienced divers as well. Um, we're all instructors. Um, the guy I was doing the training with is the guy on the right here. This is Dr. Pete Bucknell. He's an Australian, and we all kind of now know how uh, tenuous those Australians can be. Um, he's a, interestingly enough, he's a, he's a, uh, a classical musician. He plays the viola all over the world. And his wife is a uh, even more famous opera singer. Um, so he's quite an interesting individual. And he's also a dive instructor um, of some repute in, in Manhattan. He came up or he came down from New York for that. Mel Clark, Dr. Mel Clark, she's uh, one of the preeminent divers, uh, cave dive, rebreather divers in the world. As a matter of fact, she is the youngest individual to be indoctrinated into the Women Divers Hall of Fame, and she literally wrote the book on cave diving on rebreathers. As a matter of fact, this is the book she wrote on cave diving on rebreathers. So we pretty much had this process down. Um, this is, the, July 4th was my fifth day of uh, this particular training. And I'm sorry, I've got that cold thing that everybody seems to have at the aquarium, so I'm constantly afraid that I'm going to lose my voice today. So we would get up at 4 a.m. from this house called the Hydro Lodge that we rented, and the three of us would gear up into the van that we have, load up our rebreathers and all the ancillary equipment, our dry suits, everything else, <clears throat> and um, head out for the dive site, one of the cave systems that's nearby. And nearby, it really is within a two-hour drive of uh, High Springs, Florida, where we were. So on July 4th, we're heading to Ginny Springs. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Ginny Springs or even been swimming. Julie, have you? Yeah. So we get into the van, Mel always drove, uh, and our goal was to get past this sign. This sign lives in the cavern zone, um, which a lot of people who are open circuit divers have gone into caverns. You get past that sign, you ignore all these, um, these little warnings, and then you get actually into the cave, uh, and you get very, very deep into the cave. So Jenny Springs is actually a very beautiful uh, area. It's, it's, the geography is gorgeous. This whole northern Florida is gorgeous, but as I may have mentioned, this is July 4th. <laughs> this is literally a photograph from Jenny Springs this year at July 4th, and it is filled and I'm sorry, but it is filled with tens of thousands of rednecks. <laughs> Trucks with giant tires and plenty of other, you know, individuals. But it was, we were literally having to get in the water and swim beneath this in three feet of water to get out to the actual entrance to the cave system. So this is uh, the Devil's Eye Cave System. This is the Ginny Springs system. And for you here in the room, this blue area, that's the Santa Fe River. That's where all those uh, people on their tubes were. And what we wanted to do was get into what's known as the Devil's Ear. And right here, that's the Devil's Ear entrance. It's a vertical tunnel dropping 60 feet down into this cave system. <clears throat> now, as you can see, that this, is, this zoomed in view is really just a small snapshot of the overall system that's just this one cave system in North Central Florida. Um, and our goal was basically to go into, whoops, sorry, 
was to go in the devil's ear, swim through an area called the lips, which is a very, very tight restriction, um, and where you actually have to put your fins up behind you onto the ceiling and shove your way through the lips because they're, oh, by the way, a tremendous outward flow. It's called a spring. And this flow is coming out of the cave, actually trying to eject you out of the cave as you were fighting your way into the cave. Again, a very important component. So you go up here, through the lips, through this area called the keyhole, which brings you down about 94 feet. And then you follow what's called the main line, an established line that's actually the gold line in this instance because it's a gold line. And we run it all the way through to the mud tunnel. At that point, we would actually take one of our reels, tie off to the, to the, uh, the primary, the gold line, and do what's called a jump. We would actually take a reel and jump away from this in one of these bearing tunnels and find a secondary tie-off point, which is not connected to the main line because otherwise you could be confused which way to go. And then you follow that, and then we jumped over to what's known as the bone line, which came down here. And then we jumped back and caught the main line to go back out. That was the plan for the, these dives. And we actually did the, the two dives um, just according to plan. Uh, so we came along here, made a jump, came along here, made a jump, picked up the bone line. Very scary area, and I've got a video I'll play for you in a second. Very, very remote. It's a literally about an hour to this point right here of swimming um, against this current to get to the, um, the bone line. And then follow this line down, jump. And by the way, Mel sometimes would come up to us, if I was leading the dive, she came up to me with her, with her fingers made like a gun and goes into my head, bang, and then she did that to my buddy because I just killed both of us because I went the wrong direction. And if it wasn't for her, we would have headed off into the system. Now, we're in rebreathers. These machines over here like I have, um, you have to assume that that thing is going to fail. It's going to try to kill you the entire course of the dive. So you also have to lug in all the extra gas you need. If that thing dies, then you need to bring all of what's called bailout gas. You have to bring in all the extra gas so that once that thing dies, you still have enough to swim back out. Recreational divers are used to swimming with an aluminum 80 on their back. I have two aluminum 80s in front of my rebreather. I also was wearing both of those in stage red, which is not those exact tanks, but they're clipped to my sides. And I had an aluminum 40 filled with pure oxygen that we dropped just inside the system um, at the Devil's Ear entrance. And we all are bringing this much bailout with us. We're also in dry suits. And you have full redundancy, everything from multiple reels, multiple cutting implements. You're wearing this big dry suit, a full undergarment, multiple um, masks, you have backup masks, the whole nine yards. So you always have to be very, very self-sufficient. Uh, and so that's a lot of gear to be lugging into the cave against a heavy flow. Uh, and the flow is ridiculous. It's worse than any um, a current dive that I've done. And, it, and you kind of constantly feel like the mass is about to get sucked off your face and the, the breathing loop from your breather wants to get pulled out of your mouth. And you kind of wonder why you're doing this, why am I doing this? When you get away from it, you're like, oh, it's kind of fun. But at the time, <laughs> you're really not so sure. So here's a quick video. This wasn't from our trip. Pete did not shoot any video on this one. Um, I pulled this off the internet, but it actually shows this system quite nicely. And I sped it up, and I edited it together so that I don't bore you with the whole dive. Uh, and the background music, if you can hear it, um, will be, actually, I pulled it up. It was a trio that Pete was playing the viola for. So let's see if it plays. So that's diving down into the ear um, against this very strong current. These guys are using scooters, um, so they're cheating. You have to cl claw your way down. You can, your fins won't work against this flow. So you can sort of get a sense for the even, you're not even in the cave yet, but for the tightness and the, what you have to do just to wedge yourself into this cave system. You can see the guideline down there to the right. And then there's the lip that I talked about where you have to place your fins up against the ceiling and literally walk upside down through this area. You can actually see he has his fins up against it.
There's the keyhole. That descends down about 94 feet. And it's literally shaped like a keyhole. You can see the mud tunnel, if you touch that silt, that's all silt, that's why I have to do a modified fog kick. It will billow up and nothing will penetrate that. No lights. You can't see your hand in front of your face. You cannot see the line. The bone room was one of the scariest places I've ever been. It's so far back, it's so remote, and it's huge. It's, it's room after room of these huge domes, about 30 feet down to the bottom, and a lot of this area, it's a big one, it's hard to borrow. And that was where the particular drill we were doing went really poorly, uh, and I partially flooded my rebreather. Um, and what I, what I read to you before about pinning myself to the ceiling was, was happening right here in the bone room. So that kind of gives you an idea of where we were. Uh, and also I kind of want to give you the idea of the fact that I personally was fairly stressed out during this particular duo of dives. This, the, the bad dive was the first dive. The second dive was a much better dive. Um, now each dive is about two hours in duration. So you're, these aren't short dives. So there's, you know, actually it was a previous training back in March that I did. Um, that photos from, but that was actually one of the cave systems. Okay, so what happened? I didn't get bent or DCS um, while I was in the water, and um, decompression illness or the bends is something that does not typically happen right away, but takes some time for it to manifest itself in your body. Um, AGE or arterial gas embolism will show up right away, but that's not what happened to me. And I'm going to backtrack a little bit to talk a little bit what I'm really talking about here. But what you want to know now is that the first tremor um, of what happened to me happened 40 minutes after the second dive. Now keep in mind we're in northern Florida in July. It's very, very hot out. Um, and we're wearing, uh, I'm wearing um, what's called a weasel. It's, it's basically a snowsuit underneath my, um, my dry suit. And I'm wearing this for six hours straight. So that means you're sweating your butt off. Um, and I was very stressed out after that first dive. Um, it was very scary, I'm not going to lie, to come back out of the cave on a rebreather that was um, partially flooded. And, and knowing that there's no, you can't be like, time out, I'm out of here. I don't want to do this anymore. You have to do it because it's the only way to get out of the cave. So 40 minutes after the second dive, we're packing your gear up. And all of a sudden, my vision just went blurry. And I said, hey, Mel, um, I can't really focus right now. Have you seen that happen? Uh, would you? None, I wasn't thinking anything about DCS, the best. And she goes, well, you know, uh, maybe it's your nerd. <laughs> That's a real thing. My rebreather has a really cool computer on it. It's a tube that lives right against your mask. It's a little small tube. I could show you after the presentation. And if you look inside there, it projects on your eye basically a 32-inch television which shows you all the detail about what's going on inside your rebreather and your dive. And it's very, very, very complicated information. I have a second computer on my wrist and I had a third computer on my other wrist. The second computer was also plugged into my rebreather. Um, and so Mel was saying, well, you know, I've heard people having visual issues with you having that nerd right in your eye the whole time. And I'm like, well, it's both of my eyes. And I'm not really sure what's going on, but it cleared up. So we packed our gear into the van. Um, the hydro log we were staying, the house, um, was like a 20-minute drive. And about 10 minutes into the van ride, um, all hell broke loose, basically, to me. Take a pause for that. <laughs> so <clears throat> it was as if someone took their hand onto like an iPad like video display and twisted it. My vision completely went, um, I couldn't see a thing. Sorry, I could see, but I couldn't make anything out. Um, 
I couldn't like I couldn't keep my head upright. I couldn't keep my body upright. I couldn't stand. I couldn't walk. Um, it just everything stopped working for me. So we go back to the house, and and this is sort of an interesting point in time because I teach to the aquarium. I teach diving for save for professional divers, and a big component of that is talking about DCS. Um, what do you do? What are the signs? What are the symptoms? What do you look for, and how do you deal with it? So none of us really wanted to believe that I was bent. So they grabbed um, one of these oxygen tanks. There's an oxygen tank in my rear, they're pure oxygen, and the, a regulator. We had zones of those things. And I was lying down in the bench seat behind the, the driver's seat trying to breathe off this O2 regulator because you've been taught, and I teach, first thing you do is you get on the oxygen. Get back to the house. Okay, so now here's the hydro lodge. This is a lovely little place um, that was our home away from home. And actually is nicer on the inside. It's still pretty low rent. And I had just met this guy. This guy, his name is Scott, and he is dating Mel. And he was just moving from Tennessee to the middle of Florida. I forget right now. And he was coming actually going down to Tallahassee. Um, so he was driving through. I had not met this guy until the night before. Um, he had his, a big truck. He had he was towing his Jeep. He had all his dive gear. His whole life was in there. The, the group of us went out for dinner. Mel and, and Scott were going to have date night July 4th. You know, it was like he and I were going to be on our own because, um, you know, she's getting this chance to see her boyfriend. And so it was date night. So he turns out to be a very helpful guy. He turns out to be really a lifesaver for me. And he got to know me way better than I want anybody to know me. <laughs> Seriously. So we get back to the house. Um, they carry me into the building, and Scott was there. <clears throat> and I begin to vomit. But I mean, I don't mean just vomit. I mean vomit like I've never vomited before. And to be very honest, it was disgusting. I could not sit up, I could not stand up, I could not keep my head up, I could not see, and I'm now vomiting. I vomit past the point where I'm dry heaving, <clears throat> and then I'm vomiting up this red stuff. And it's like, oh, that can't be good. It's like, is that my stomach that's coming out? And he's holding me, <laughs> this poor guy on date night. <laughs> Instead, he's holding this stranger, um, and he, you know, with the trash can off the side of my bed. So at that point, Pete comes running in <clears throat> and he lifts up my shirt. And I have all these violent red welts down my left side and across my stomach. And that's not good. I'm thinking, what's happening to me? And I'm still denying that I'm bent. I'm really trying to work on how am I gonna get back in the water tomorrow? We're actually working up for some very deep dives to the 180 plus feet on Trimex, and I needed to focus on that because that's what I'm here for. And when everybody saw that, um, on my stomach and on my side, nobody questioned what was wrong with me. So I had all these welts, I don't have a picture, I, there was pictures of this, not of me, but of other people, I didn't bother putting it on here, it's pretty gross, but down my left side, across my stomach, and so Pete circled a bunch of them with a Sharpie and wrote the time and date on my stomach. And then they, they kind of went into, now Mel had already been making tremors of, of trying to find a, a hyperbaric chamber, what to do with this guy. She had called the local cave um, dive shop and was like, trying to be really quiet about, listen, we might need some more oxygen here at the Hydro Lodge. And um, at that point, I could not breathe off this regulator. I could not, there was nothing I can do to breathe off the regulator. I could not tolerate this thing in my mouth. The, the, the resistance of breathing was far too high. And I said, I need a non-rebreather mask. It's a, it's a type of oxygen delivery system that hospitals use. It's an oral nasal mask in a bag. And I've taught usage of this to everybody who's taken my class, and I had to have that. Um, I could not go off a, um, um, a regulator. And the problem with that is it uses a different system of fittings. And so all of a sudden, all this oxygen that we had, you know, tons and tons of oxygen went away because I couldn't breathe off a regulator. So luckily, the dive shop had an adapter. They went and got it, brought it back, and they, they, uh, they loaded me back in the van. 
and they drove me to the, the nearest emergency room. So that's at that point, that's the non rebreather mask. Um, those are all the Jenny Springs entry bands because we had prepaid being July 4th weekend for you know the time we're going to be in that system. Of course, I only used one of them that this trip. This is right about when uh, Scott called my wife. So we went to Lake City Medical Center, um, who is not equipped to deal with any kind of diving injury. As it turns out, there is no chamber in Northern Florida whatsoever, period, that will accept divers. So here I am, a pretty bent individual. They dragged me into this room. I mean, this, you know, they had the full ED was ready. Um, as it turns out, they were going to fly me on a medevac, but there was a front coming through the whole northern Florida. They grounded all the flights. So they ended up shipping me from this emergency department to another one. So that's Mel and I. I'm looking pretty happy. Um, that's my bucket, which I was about to use. Uh, once again, I'm on a non-rebreather mask. Uh, and so they basically stabilized me, um, gave me some anti-nausea, and they loaded me into an ambulance. I remember being in the ambulance and Mel came with me um, and like, like being like, oh crap, there's all these sirens going off. It's gonna slow down our transfer to this. I'm like, oh, that's me. <laughs> so that's for me. So like I said, no hyperbaric chambers in Northern Florida. The nearest one was in the South Georgia Medical Center in South Georgia. And I had to take an ambulance. So here I am. Uh, many hours later, from when the, inc the incident happened, um, this is Becky. She became a very dear uh, friend of mine, and, was, and um, she actually now has, actually in, this, in the hyperbarics um, chamber area, the marine mammals has, they have a, one of the marine mammals' trumpet um, painted a painting that I sent to them, and they were so happy to get that. So they actually have that there at the uh, South Georgia Medical Center, and that's Marcus down there. So they're getting me ready to, uh, to go into the chamber. So here's uh, just some pictures of her, you know, doing whatever. I'm not going to talk about what that is, but I will say that I was incredibly dehydrated, like severely, dangerously dehydrated with low potassium. Um, and that's, we'll talk about that in a second. So, and that's my sippy cup. Um, I'm going into a pure oxygen pressurized environment, basically the best ingredients for a bomb. So everything that has to um, go into that chamber has to be non-static. And you can't spill stuff, you can't make a mess. And so they give you a sippy cup so that you put fluid in there uh, and also a special um, hospital gown or you know, outfit that's um, material that doesn't create static. So they put me in their hyperbaric chamber. Now, there's a very specific um, process that you go through to, to deal with um, decompression sickness. And Navy, um, the Navy, US Navy has sort of established the guidelines for that. So the most aggressive, longest um, system is the Navy, US Navy Table 6. So that's a five hours straight inside this chamber. So they put me in for the Navy Table 6. And what it is, it's, it's a pure oxygen environment, that's the green, so 20 minutes pure oxygen, um, and they bring you to the equivalent of um, three atmospheres or 66 feet in depth. So you're pressurized and you're in the pure oxygen environment. But of course, anybody who's at least taken um, uh, nitrox um, will know that you can't breathe um, elevated pressures of oxygen for extended periods of time because you will get something called Come on, just one of you guys who has, I know Luigi, you know, because you're an instructor. Yeah, so you get CNS toxicity. You get central nervous system toxicity, which means you'll go into convulsions, um, and they try to avoid that. And that's a big thing when you're rebreather diving because you're breathing such high concentrations of uh, O2. I'm very familiar with it. So that means you have a mask in the chamber with you, and every periodic time, you have to put that mask on, but you're breathing air. You go on air breaks, so you don't convulse. Unfortunately, there's also um, pulmonary toxicity, where pure oxygen is a corrosive element. It will actually start to corrode your lungs um, on a long-term basis. So you also have to deal with that. So they put me in for five hours, 
and then you're allowed to extend it twice for one hour. So they extended it two more times, so I was in that chamber for seven hours straight. It's just a narrow little tube that you live in for seven hours. And meanwhile, <clears throat> I messed up. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm really messed up. And I'm, I'm seeing things. My, my vision is so screwed up. I have the nystagmus. My eyes are going you know, back and forth like mad. Now, those first seven hours are kind of a nightmare for me, which I don't really recall, except for the fact that I was reliving a lot of stuff. You know, you're just replaying. You're sort of stuck in, um, in a skip mode. So that's the chamber. They have to put you on a, um, a wristband that's like an anti-static wristband just to ensure that you don't blow up, um, which I would prefer. That's the door and all the um, electronics and you know, you're, you're wired into EKG and you've got the air. All that passes through bulkhead fittings on the door and you go into this tube. So that's my home for the next seven hours. And the damn thing when they pressurize it, I'm equalizing here because of course I'm descending right now. Um, the door would go tink, <laughs> which scared the living crap out of me because I think it's about to explode. And then I got to learn that it would do three tinks during the pressurization process. And of course, adiabatic heating, it gets really hot in there. Um, and when they bring you back to the surface, it's like an air conditioner and it's freezing. Um, so you end up uh, like violently shaking at the end of every session. So. I spent five days going between chamber rides and living in the ICU unit at this hospital for a total of 21 hours in the hyperbaric chamber. It was, it was a really weird time. I didn't have my contacts because I was not where my stuff was. I didn't have my glasses. I didn't have my cell phone charger. I couldn't see because of contacts now. My vision was better, but it's still very, very blurry. Um, I couldn't get in communication with anybody. Uh, it was just very strange. I didn't even know where I was. You know, the nurses on a shift, ch chain shifts in the ICU would come in and they'd take blood and they'd try to sneak potassium in you, which sucks. And then they um, would ask things like, who's the president? Or where are you? And I had no idea where I was. It turns out I was in Valdosta? Valdosta. I was in Valdosta, Georgia um, for five days and I had no clue. So there's my ICU unit. I'm not going to, I'm going to run out of time, so I don't. I fought this bed. The bed was automated, and it would it would have these air chambers that would fight against you because you're in an ICU. They're not used to people who are you know more with it. Also, you're in a pure oxygen environment for so long. My heart rate kept falling and falling and falling, setting off the alarm system. And so I had them lower it from the 60 to 50, and finally I had them lower it to 40, so that 40 beats per minute the alarm would go off. But every time I relaxed, I would go below 40. And so the alarms would start going off, and so I never slept all night long. I just rode this curve of, of, of drifting off and then coming back when the alarms would go off. And then the cuff would come on, and, um, and I had these leg things on that were squeezing your legs continuously. So I was like in this machine that was fighting me the entire time I was there. Scott came down. He drove the two hours from um, High Springs to Valdosta to bring me all my stuff and then back again. I mean, the poor guy was like supposed to be long gone and here he was staying um, in the area to, uh, to deal with me. So Amy had to fly down. Um, I couldn't fly. I, um, so she had to fly down from, uh, from Boston to uh, High Springs, Florida, where she picked up all my gear and then drove to Georgia. And then she had to drive me 1,300 miles home which was not part of the plan. And she was already kind of on my case about how much this particular training was costing me. A rebreather is about $15,000 by itself. And that's just the rebreather. Um, everything else, just forget about it. So this was getting to be a very expensive, very expensive trip for me. So what's the cause of DCS? I'm gonna to try to go a little quickly. I don't wanna keep you guys lying and have to be here. Well, this is one of the favorite things I found because I became the educator with all the doctors, all the medical professionals that I had to deal with. I became the, the person to educate them. It's very, very hard to find anybody who has any definitive knowledge on this across the globe. I mean, or at least across the states. I've been working with Divers Alert Network. They love me um, because it's a great case for them. But, uh, but nobody, no one person has a really good grasp still of what happens here. So Commander Joe Duturi, a mixed gas saturation dive officer from the US Navy, 
at a presentation in, in water recompression really nailed this whole thing. He said, ask a brand new diver, what causes DCS? And they'll say, I don't know, it's got something to do with bubbles. I've heard that a lot. Ask an open water instructor and they'll grab a soda bottle, shake it up and say something about coming up too fast. I've heard that a lot. Oh, what, did you come up too fast? It's really hard to come up fast in a cave. <laughs> Ask a tech diver and they'll start telling you about different gases, gradient factors, partial pressures and bubble seeding theories. And who has heard of isobaric counter diffusion? It's a way of getting bent without changing depth at all, but by changing bleeding mixture. If you ask a dive physician, they'll start telling you about bubble tensions, intravascular versus extravascular formation and physiological response. But if you ask five people, the five smartest people in the world who have made the study of hyperbaric medicine and physiology their life's work, if you ask them what causes DCS, they'll say, I don't know, it's got something to do with bubbles. <laughs> it's 100% true. So the things, what happened? Well, I'll tell you, I'm not going to go through this. This is my setup. I had, like I said, three computers. I was breathing, um, you know, different mixes of gases that you don't need to know about. Um, I had a lot of gear on, um, you know, dry suit. My computers were set up. I was doing a, a 2080 gradient factor, which I sent out an email about gradient factor, so all the divers here know all about that. Probably not. Um, but basically, everything was by the book. My first dive... This is my, my profile as my, reported by my rebreather. And as you can see, I came up to the 20 foot level and did, this is my deco obligation. And I, I just sat there for my deco. And then we actually added safety beyond your deco obligation because that was our standard practice. Um, this is my oxygen. This is the partial pressure of O2. And what you want is, I was running my rebreather manually, but I was keeping it at 1.3 with the ideal oxygen to maximize oxygen and minimize inert gas loading. And as you can see, I really wasn't screwing around with that. And then when you get shallow enough, you can actually make it a pure oxygen rebreather, which is why it went up there. So I was breathing perfect um, mixtures of gas. In the second dive, same thing. And it was a two hour surface interval between those two dives. And by the way, that's the log on the way out. That's at 20 feet. You just wrap your legs around that and you sit there. You have this perfect deco position where you don't change an inch, you know, as you're on that lock. So it's very easy to do the deco as long as you didn't let your legs relax and it would spit you vertically up out of the, uh, out of the tube. What happened to me, the best I can tell, best any of the dive medical professionals that I've talked to, is a perfect storm of conditions. I was stressed. Stress is a huge um, factor in DCS. That first dive was a horrible dive um, and very, very scary. And I've done a lot of training. I was incredibly dehydrated. Being in the dry suit in northern Florida for six hours a day, day after day after day, I was also on hydrochlorothiazide for high blood pressure, which is a diuretic. That was one thing that I should have been more aware of and I wasn't. That was really my bad. My doctors never warned me about it. I've since changed my primary care physician but I should have been a little more educated on, on a diuretic because that dehydrates you even further. I had a bronchial infection when I was on the Bahamas trip um, in a, for the aquarium about two months earlier, month and a half earlier. And so I had this residual cough. And I actually went and had a chest x-ray and then a CT scan to make sure that my lungs were okay for this training. But I never thought that I just was concerned about them trapping gas in my lungs. And I was never thinking about coughing as a pressure change because, and a tremendous exertion. I mean, like I said, you're fighting your way into this cave, you're sweating up tremendously, you're dehydrating yourself in the cave, um, and all those things factor in. But the icing on the cake, the real killer, was that I have, as it turns out, a PFO, a pain form in ovale, which is a hole between the left and the right side of the left and right atrium in your heart. So I was coughing, and that cough, actually does a pressure differential in your heart. And what happens is inert gas loaded blood from your venous system comes in and instead of going to your lungs where you breathe it out, it bypasses through this hole in your heart and goes back in your arterial system. And so all this gas that normally vents its way out through your lungs gets reloaded back into your system. And so um, that was the killer for me. And by coughing, I'm just causing that, that issue to happen um, repeatedly over and over again for hours upon hours in these dives. 
So doctors, doctors everywhere. I've seen more doctors in the time um, preceding or after this event. It's ridiculous. I went to Mass General ER, and this is after leaving Valdosta uh, and High Springs and, and that other medical center. I've gone to a hyperbaric and dive medical specialist down in the Cape. Um, I've seen several neurologists. I've had a brain MRI, which did show up some um, uh, white hyperintensities, which were probably caused by this, um, by this event. But they had, this is many, many weeks after the event, so we don't have the comparative, which is a lesson. If you have an issue like this, get a brain MRI uh, as soon as possible. I've seen, of course, cardiologists, vestibular diagnostics lab, uh, medical optometrist, and of course my primary care physician. You get the idea. I've seen a lot of sick and tired doctors. Um, plus, I resort network. So Peter Buzzacott, Director of Injury Monitoring Prevention, is the guy I've been dealing with directly. And through him, Dr. Neil Pollock, who is the entire head of the entire research department at Dan, is very, very interested in my particular case because it was what's called an um, unjustified hit. Mark, I think you've had a term that a wildcat wild in commercial diving. I've never heard that, but I like that. And then Doug Ebersol, who is a cardiologist and doing a Dan study on PFOs and decompression sickness. So I'm a part of that study now. Um, was a great consultant on this whole thing. And as a matter of fact, so there is this study that he's running. And at the same time in July, the Underseen Hyperbaric Medical Society had a symposium up in Montreal on PFOs and DCS. And they have a consensus statement coming out on this, but it's not published yet, so I don't know the results of it yet, which is driving me nuts. So what is a PFO? Peyton means open, formidable volley, hole in the heart. So like I said, venous blood loaded with inert gas bypass in the lungs. It's very common, you're born, you have a PFO for a reason. It allows you to not use your lungs when you're in vitro, so you are, not, you know, everybody has that, but when you're born, it seals up. One in five people, it doesn't seal up properly. And it's not a problem, um, unless, unfortunately, it, it becomes a problem. There's um, a potential increase in, in the risk of strokes because uh, of that same kind of thing. Um, and like a, a, you can get a, a gas slug from your legs and it can skip through your, bypass your lungs, skipping through the PFO and go to your brain. Um, same kind of deal as what happened to me, different um, reasons. And how do you diagnose it? Okay, and my talk is almost over. So I had what's called transthoracic echocardiogram with bubble study. They basically take um, an echocardiogram and then they take a saline solution that they agitate with air bubbles. And they inject that in your vein and they look to see it come into your heart and see if it skips across to the other side of your heart. And so this <clears throat> short video shows that actually happening. So you'll see the bubbles coming here. That is actually a PFO right there, that little flap. And you'll see bubbles then bypassing the lungs and going, skipping over to the other side. If I can figure out how to do that, there we go. So in a, in a, in a second, you'll see the bubbles entering and it's very, um, very obvious. And then you can see them over there. So that you should have a minimum of four beats before you see bubbles because of you know, getting around. And you can see that that was less than four beats. I had that, the weirdest thing was I was lying on this table as they were, had the EKG on, the echocardiogram on me and the nurse was injecting me with the, I saw my own heart beating and the bubbles coming into it and going across, which is a very strange sensation. So what, what happens if you have a PFO and it's deemed that you need to have it fixed? Can it be fixed? Well, <laughs> I think this is like the second to last image on this. It can be fixed, and this is how they do it. They insert in your thigh a tube that follows a vein all the way up into your heart. It's almost there. I'm amazed by this. Once it gets into your heart, they guide it directly to the PFO. And they basically deploy what looks like two cocktail um, umbrellas. One for one side of the heart, and then they pull back and they deploy the second one. 
and then they disconnect, and then that creates a temporary patch to your PFO, and then tissue will form over that to permanently seal it. A week from tomorrow, I'm getting this procedure. I'm not really looking forward to it. It's, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the worst thing is, is that they, uh, they also put a, a probe down your throat for a transesophageal echocardiogram, which is a much higher, intent, uh, higher resolution imaging. And so you have to be awake to gulp down this massive probe. I made the mistake of Googling it and watching some videos, which I should never have done. Um, and now it stresses me out. So denial is a real thing. I am a diet professional. I was denying, I was bent. I was with another diet professional and someone who literally wrote the book on, on diet. She's also a doctor. Breathing oxygen off a of regulator can be intolerable. I teach that, but I never really understood the mechanism, but it's true. Marking skin symptoms with a Sharpie so you can see progression or remission is really, really uh, a smart thing to do. And the hospital was loving that because they could see that they, there were a lot more welts by the time I got to the chamber than the ones that were circle. Um, so they could see that it was getting worse. And I, by the way, I felt like um, from that, I felt like someone had just beaten me with a sledgehammer for like a week and a half. I was just, I, was, I hurt so much under my armpits and my shoulders, my left side, and my whole um, abdomen region. Having a strong advocate is incredibly important because no one knew what to do. I mean, Mel did, and she was, because she's down in Cape Country all the time, and, and she is a very strong, driven individual, and you need that, someone who's going to make things happen. The ED was prepared for me on July 4th. Um, when I arrived, they had already determined they couldn't fly me and they had an ambulance waiting for me there. And they had, in um, South Georgia Medical Center, they had brought in staffing for the chamber, even though it was July 4th. Um, so having an, an advocate for you is incredibly important. And documentation is critical because you do become the educator. Um, people would look at this and be like, that is so cool. As opposed to, like, these are medical professionals who loved hearing about it, but then they were like, well, I've I don't know anything about this. Um, Dan membership does not provide insurance. I actually, there was a time when Dan membership provided a base level of coverage for die of accidents. It's not true. I had anymore. I had zero coverage from Dan. You need to have the insurance. I've racked up so far, it's going up over $44,000 from this. Luckily, our health insurance here is, is, is taking care of this except for the deductible. Um, so it's, it's amazing, but it could have gone in another direction. Dan insurance is really important. Um, okay, so that's it. Anybody have any questions? I know I talked a lot, and everybody's kind of probably getting it going, but yes, Sherry. So once you were under treatment, what did you, when did you start to feel better? Six weeks. Like the only thing that resolved in the chamber, it's a really good question, were the, the topic of the skin vents. Those started resolving right away. And by the time I came out of the first chamber ride, all the welts were gone, or most of them. Um, but my, my, and my nausea um, was probably because of the medicine as opposed to the chamber ride. Um, my, my equilibrium and my vision um, and, uh, and my memory and things like that uh, were all messed up for about five weeks. And it was a very, I, we actually installed an eye chart in our home that, you know, and Amy would make me do the art chart. She'd make me do the Sharp and Romberg or the, the, you know, the walk to, you know, to see how you are. Um, because the nystagmus, the shifting eyes, resolved within, well, it took about, I, my eye doctor said I still have it two weeks ago. But, I mean, it really took about three or four days for it to really go away to the point where you can't really see it. So it, it was a very slow um, recovery for me, and, and that was kind of surprising. Yeah. Yeah. What was your first dive after the Oh, I can't dive. Okay. Um, so I am grounded. So the Navy says three months from a type 2 DCS hit if it's severe, which is what I have. It's a, a neurological um, DCS hit. And that's for young, fit Navy divers. So okay. Diver Alert Network says six months from, um, from resolution of symptoms. And so I'm grounded until January. Uh, and that's, that, that comes down from Dive's Alert Network. And then the, the dive medicine doctor in the Hyannis is, um, is underscoring that. So the PFO closure, 
I can recover from fairly quickly, but it's the, it's the overall just dealing with the, what happened to me in six months. So my first time hasn't happened yet, but I'll let you know <laughs> in January. Bill? Crash course. No, I, <laughs> I have to go back. <laughs> I, and and that's, a, that's the other thing. That's an elephant in the room at home between Amy and I, a conversation that we have yet to have. Because she's okay with me recreational diving, she is not okay with me getting back under a rebreather or tending or mixed gas diving. And by the way, that machine, I'm confident, maybe it, it either saved my life or it made the symptoms a lot better. Because, because I was on that thing, I was diving the optimal mix always. If I was diving open circuit, I would have planned my dive for the deepest expected depth, which is 94 feet. Yet we would have been at 64 feet, really, for the entire length of the dive meaning that my inert gas loading would have been a lot higher than what it was on this machine. So it potentially saved my life. And I, I'm using that as my argument with Amy. But I have to go back and, um, and finish the course. Yeah. Yeah. Tim. Good to see you, John. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so the, uh, this question about insurance, uh, some of us have relied on Dan for many years for the what-if scenarios. We also have this international travel insurance. Right. But you're never really sure what you get from them until something like this happens. And you know, we're out in the field in pretty <coughs> remote places a lot. Do you have any, uh, based on this experience, what, what was it about Dan that was so good? Is this a bigger conversation between the aquarium? This is a continuous conversation that DSOs have amongst DSOs. <laughs> because where does the coverage um, from your workman's comp end and Dan picks up? And, and does it change when you have a volunteer diver versus a staff diver? Uh, the general consensus is that workman's comp will cover aquarium activities regardless of your staff situation, like if you're in employment, um, like being getting paid for, or under, you know, if you're a volunteer. However, certain things may take a lot longer to resolve, like helicopter rides. Um, and so Dan, sort of like, if you have the insurance, they will blanket cover you, period. And then you can work out who's going to really pay for the long run. But it takes away the stress of like, I mean, I was really stressed out that I was going to be on the hook for, you know, 45, probably $60,000 when it's all said and done. Um, and if I had had that insurance, then it wouldn't have been a problem. If I had gone to Cunningham and done this under the Cunningham, then I would not have <laughs> I guess I'll never get that coming. <laughs> um, and uh, by the way, this is just uh, a goofy little thing that he shot. So we're trying to get all lined up. That's it. Yeah, Mark. So, what is um, part of the recruiting process? Do you have anything that you need to do? Like, for example, are you restricted to drinking alcohol? Um, I was first told that I shouldn't exercise because of the potential for, and then I was told that I should be exercising. So, so I tentatively began an exercise regimen um, that was actually very difficult because my vision was still so weird that um, I, I would, and my um, equilibrium was so weird for about a month and a half, really about six weeks after this, that I uh, would go and try stuff and then had a really hard time. Like, it's amazing because the neurologist asked me if this was happening. Things would jump out at me all the time. And then there was nothing there, but it would, because what has happened is your eye would shift. And so these weird peripheral things would jump out at you uh, and freak you out. Um, and this was happening, like I said, for over a month after, and it still happens a little bit. Like if I can't look at something that's, waving like a like a little lights that has like a little crackle to it i just can't i can't do it um, but anyway so they said there was a progressive addition adding to your um, exercise regimen to get that beyond that um, but there's there's a, also a diminishing returns on hyperbaric treatments and if you go two sessions without any um, marked improvement then then nothing's going to help you um, as far as hyperbaric medicine is concerned so that's when that's how they decided that I was done and time for Amy to drive me home. And that's why Mass Ioneer didn't take me in up here because of that.
Yeah. Um, seven hours, and that was with no delays. I mean, really, there was a little bit of that denial in the house, um, and that's so that's the best situation. Quite often, you're talking maybe twenty hours before um, you're getting, and so and it's that speed to entering in the chamber which is so important. Yeah, and so seven hours is that, and you know, and I was I was on auction that whole time. Um, and I did get oxygen toss. I get the pulmonary corrosion, and it's it's you get, you get that rebreather diving anyway. But I had so much pure O2 in me that my lungs were it just hurt like hell to breathe, and then just a lot of coughing fits and stuff. And that took about um, two weeks to to go away because your lungs have to heal afterwards. Yeah, Luigi. What was the goal of the mod two train? Is it like a deeper operating um, No, mod two is uh, is you go into um, normoxic trimix. So you go into trimix that doesn't go below 20% oxygen. So that limits your depth to about 180, 190 feet. And then mod three is um, hypoxic trimix, which is, you know, you do the, the less than 16% um, oxygen so you can go down to, you know. And so I'm, I'm hypoxic trimix certified, but an open circuit, but I had to start all over again for rebreather. So the normoxic trimix is what mod two is. The full cave CCR, we're just combining the two into one, one program. Yeah. That's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I was like, I gotta get through this, both between my voice cracking up, and but also you get like, there's a you have to relive a little bit of it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, what a what a adventure! Yeah, adventure. That was that's a good one. Yeah, that was good. I talked to Chris. I think he was um, watching it. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, I made it. I made it. Through. 
The first time was great. I feel very educated. Good. Very yes. educated. And that's why I'm, I'm so happy to be this because of that. Like, yeah. I want people to at least not be like so, like, I don't know, what, what does that mean? You know, because that's something that's